If you are wonky enough to look into um, the histories and origins of spiritual philosophies and what grew out of those which would be called religions, you run across a word which is a really interesting word. It's the word, it's the word oracle. And the definition of an oracle is a source of spiritual hyphen life hyphen wisdom. Spiritual life wisdom. The oracle. Um, this is the stuff of Shakespearean plays. This is the stuff of ancient writings. This is the stuff that was debated by rabbis and monks and lamas, debated around fires, talked about in temples, written about endlessly, filling the libraries of religion everywhere that they may exist. The oracle. So what is it that we look to for the wisdom? And down through the ages, all kinds of ideas have come out about this. It could be a person. A lot of times, the oracle was a person. You know, we think of Jesus, Buddha, Lao Tzu, Muhammad, Seattle. It could be a place. It could be a mountaintop. It could be a valley. It could be a pyramid somewhere. It could be a lake or an ocean, a seashore, a river. It can be an object, a crystal, a special stone, a special coin. It can be a work of art. It can be a temple. And so growing out of the idea of oracle, which is, you know, where do we look to for wisdom, the religions began to grow. And so... It doesn't take long before you say, okay, if a person, Jesus, is an oracle, then we begin to build the mythology around that to support that. If it is the Buddha, if it is whoever it is, if it is a place, then we make the pilgrimages there. We pray to that. We sit in the midst of that. If it's an older woman who lives up a path in a cabin and we call her a midwife or a healer, we may go visit her sit on her front porch and ask her questions, bring forward our ideas. It could be a council. It could be a dance. It could be a song. All these places were places, people, and things that we as humanity have gone forward into to find the wisdom. I bring this up today because uh, today is kind of a very personal story. I, I tell stories on myself from time to time, but this is probably the most personal aspect of my own spiritual journey that I can bring forward. When I was um, growing up, I was raised in a fundamentalist, born-again Christian church. And I really wanted to um, embrace that. I wanted to bring that into my life because I loved my parents and, I, and they were so into it and I wanted to be part of that. And it became very obvious to me at a very, very young age that in order to be part of the family tribe, I needed to be a Christian. And so I tried hard. And so once a week, and this is all prior to the age of 10 uh, that I'm going to talk about, once a week, we would go to that church on Sunday. We went Sunday morning, and we went Sunday evening, and I did Sunday school, and I sat through sermons and junior churches, and I went to prayer meetings, and I, I listened to the choir, and I listened to the preacher, and I had my little King James Version Bible with the red around the edges and the red letter Jesus Bible, and I really tried to get into it. But there was a conflict within my life that... I never really even realized until later on when I began to take my own spiritual journey. And that was that I went to church one day a week, but I was in the wilderness for seven days a week. And what I mean by that is that prior to the age of 10, our family lived in the wilderness far outside the town where we went to church. And in that wilderness, I was surrounded by things like the Feather River at that time, and I was surrounded by, and I think this just went away. So. Why don't you go ahead and put me here? Look in here. Oh, what is it? I'm sorry. Okay. I thought it went away. Okay. 
I was surrounded by the Feather River, and one of my one of my most vivid memories is salmon runs that took place in that river as a little kid, and how that river would turn red with salmon when they would come up th- through there. And I remember going to an old gentleman who lived nearby, and I asked him about that because I was drawn to the salmon, I was drawn to the color, I was drawn to the magic that that had that that seemed to have. But at the same time, I was frightened by it because the fish were so red and they were so beaten up and they were so uh, disfigured. And so I was drawn to it, but I was repelled to it by this, at the same time. So I asked this older gentleman, I said, can you tell me about this? And he said, well, he said, these, these fish are coming up to spawn, to lay their eggs so that they can start the next generation. And I said, where did they come from? And he said, they came from the ocean. It's like, what? I was so blown away by that because as a little kid, I, whenever you said ocean to me, I, I thought of San Francisco or maybe Fort Bragg. And it just seemed like it took, back in those days, it seemed like when my family went there, it took us all day to get there. And somehow these fish came up these rivers to find this place from the ocean. Just to, you know, to lay their, you know, just to, I thought, to lay their, they just went coming up to lay their eggs, right? And then I noticed that they died, and I noticed that all the animals that lived in the area would come feast on them, and I noticed the fishermen that would come in and look for them. I noticed all the birds that would come in and deal with all of that. It seemed so magical to me. But then I asked the old guy this one question that just blew my mind. I said, how did they know to come here? He said, because they were here before. What? They were here before. They went down to the ocean and they came back. How long have they been gone? A number of years before they came back. I was drawn to wildflowers filled with butterflies and salamanders who I could watch their lifestyle. And I was drawn to the shedding of reptiles in their skin. And to this day, there's a part of that that I find defies words that became a spiritual place in my soul that became home. And so as a child, my oracle was naturally nature. If I was upset, if I was happy, if I didn't know what to do, if I was trying to hide out or I was trying to find companionship or make sense of the world or just simply run about and enjoy, I always turned to nature. And I lived in a time, I'm old enough to have lived in a time, my, my parents were not helicopter parents and they turned me loose. I have no idea why I wasn't bitten by a rattlesnake 500 times, but I literally ran around out there. And in the community I lived in, there were very few children. I had a couple of good friends, but that was it. And to me, I felt like I found myself out there. Nature was not separate from, it was part of me. I felt that I could see the expressions in nature's face, no matter what it took on, that reflected back to me what it was to be a living being, what it was to be caught into the natural cycles that were so mystical and magical and yet made so much sense. And so at the age of 10, we made a move into civilization and that was something that was shocking to me. And then secondly, I was put into religious education to where my seven days a week that I spent in nature were now replaced with at least six days a week where I was in formal religious education. And I struggled there. I was held back one year. I never got good grades. I struggled with authority figures. I struggled with teachers. But at the same time, I so desperately wanted to grab a hold of their idea of the oracle. But I couldn't. It's a conflict that I have been to therapy over, counseling over. I have sought other things that were not healthy over. It is something that had derailed my life. 
It was a profound spiritual conflict. I didn't even understand that until my early 30s. And so eventually I broke away and I went into the wilderness, a different kind of wilderness for me, to try and find my way with something that made sense, which eventually brought me to metaphysics. So when we think about the idea of the oracle, I want to read something to you from Ernest Holmes, who's the founder of this movement. He said, the great divine presence. So how do we translate that? God, spirit, first cause, the great creator, the mother, father. The great divine presence is not the vested right of any religion, sect, or order, but rather here, here for all of us. It's here. It's within us. It's around us. We are in it. It is in us. It's a power. It's a force. It is creative. It is loving. It is in the butterflies and the salmon. It is in the salamanders. It is in the river. It's in everything that exists. Holmes says, great divine presence, God is not the vested right of any religion, sect, or order, but rather here for all of us. We, this teaching, have nothing new. We simply have a new approach to an ancient truth. So what is that new approach? When you become familiar with our teaching, and I know a lot of you are familiar with our teaching, there is this idea the bedrock of idea is that we are a teaching of evolution, personal evolution. Because Ernest Holmes, I think, had one basic, clear, simple, but profound question. If the oracle is Jesus, and Jesus left here 2,000 years ago, then what do I do? If the, oracle, if the oracle is a specific mountain, but I don't live in the, where that mountain is, I don't make that pilgrimage, then what do I do? If that oracle is a sacred piece of scripture that is housed in a library or a museum of some kind, and I'm not in the presence of that scripture, then what do I do? And so what Holmes says is we are drawn to the wisdoms that are there for us that become the religion of us. I referred to that in my prayer earlier, the religion of you. And so let me share an experience I had with you that is going to maybe hopefully change your idea of what a minister in the 21st century is, at least in this teaching. So, and I want to I want to be very clear here. I'm I'm aware of cultural appropriation, cultural appropriation, and I'm not practicing that. I'm I, hopefully I'm practicing cultural appreciation. So I'm going to talk about a couple Native American concepts. So I've always been intrigued by the idea within the Native American concepts, and I'm going to be using a word that comes from us, that comes to us from the Plains tribes. But most Native American tribes and traditions did have this practice that we would call the vision quest. And the vision quest is basically this idea that young people, very often about the time they hit puberty, you know, they're, they're being raised in the tribe, they're around the traditions, they're around the dances, they're around the folklore, they're around the shaman, they're around the parents, they're around the goings on, and so they kind of begin to absorb the culture. But there's not what we would call in the Western thinking this intense kind of religious training. They just seem to be around it. Then they hit puberty, and then they come in, they come under the 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 authority of the shaman. And that, that's also an anthropological word. That's not a tribal word. Okay. And the shaman would begin to spend time with them, do rituals with them. 
uh, get to know them, teach them more about some of the, the folklore and the ideas behind religious constructs. And he would educate them, both the, the, the males and the females, the women and the, and the men, the young people. He would teach them about this idea that we are surrounded in spirit. This idea that what we call spirit and how we relate to spirit is kind of up to us to interpret what it is around us that reflects back to us what we are innately in the midst of. Boy, that's a mouthful. You should think about that for a moment. That what is around you and reflecting back to you originates in you, basically. In other words, as Holmes would say in the Bible and Jesus and other people, by your belief it is done unto you. And so, where do I find my wisdom? Where does my belief take me in terms of my wisdom? So then at some point, the young people would be allowed to go into the wilderness, and there were all kinds of rituals around this, and spend some time alone. And they would be stressed at some point. Could be physical stress, could be emotional stress, could be both. Um, Placed in a situation where they had to rely upon themselves in terms of how they related to being out there. And in some cases, you would read about uh, the reason it's called uh, a vision quest is because there would be some visioning that happened, and they would be taught to vision. In our Western culture, we look, we look a lot to narcotics and other things to, to create visions, but our ancestors, they knew how to create visions without that. And so these young people were taught to have visions to where they could see through what in our teaching we would say to look through the veil and see the commonality of spirit in the natural world. Metaphysics, if you look it up in the dictionary, is a word defined, it says beyond the physical. But in terms of a working definition, what I've been taught is metaphysics is the connection between the physical and spiritual realm in terms of what we can see and experience. So after a period of time, when these young people had gone through whatever they'd gone through and had the experiences they had, they would come back. And in some tribes, that would be the time. Now remember, they're in puberty at this point. That would be the time where they would actually declare their own name that they would be known by the rest of their lives. In some tribes, young people didn't have names until they went on their vision quest. They came back with their name. And their name was very often connected to what they discovered out there. They also discovered out there their own connections to truth. Spirit animals, spiritual geographical places, spiritual experiences, spiritual elements. Where they lived, their place. It wasn't... For them, it wasn't a pyramid in Egypt because that wasn't part of their experience. Their experience was the oak tree, the owl, the flower, the butterfly, the insect, the river, the storm. They reflected back to them some sort of truth. And when they came back, they would be interviewed by the shaman to say, what, what, is, it, what is it about your medicine that you bring back? That's what it was called. It was called medicine, a person's medicine. Meaning, in our 21st century sensibility, what is my truth? What is my philosophy? Where is it that I look for the truth? How does my intuition work? What is my place? What is my meaning? What is my purpose? It was referred to as their medicine. And so I, you know, I found this incredibly interesting in my own metaphysical journey because I found out that I am in charge of discovering what, where it is in my life as I live my life where I can find my own discern, discernments, my own truths, the wisdoms that I need to live my life the very best way I can. 
Well, a few years ago, I was given an, an invitation. There was a gentleman I knew who had a um, who had diagnosis of a very serious medical condition, and he and his wife had gotten a hold of, and they were um, they were of European descent, like I am. They got a hold of a what was a gentleman who was referred to as a singer in his tribe. In other words, a, a holy man, a, a, a shaman of some kind, but he was referred to as a singer if he would come out and do a, a healing ritual for the person I knew. So anyway, I was invited to attend this, and it was this, you know, for, for the full day, we, we didn't get together until, like, say, 9 or 10 o'clock at night, and for the full day, I was, uh, there were things I had to do to prepare personally to enter into this, and I did all that stuff, and so I entered into it. And it went on from about 10 o'clock at night until probably 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning, this ritual that he performed. And it was, it was one of the most amazing things I've ever been through. And it was a real honor to be a part of that. And not just to, like, be in the bleachers. We, there were singing we did. We did prayers together. We, you know, all that stuff and, and the, the ceremonies. So anyway, uh, when it was over, uh, one of the things we were supposed to do, and they said, you know, we all had to bring food because they said, when this is over, we all feast together. That was part of it. So it was kind of like a potluck, but we're, you know, we're sitting down to eat about 3 o'clock in the morning. You know? And um, so the gentleman who was the singer sat with us and was eating, and I got to talking to him. And I was, at that time, I, was, I had been a religious science minister, new thought minister, and, uh, you know, I grew, I grew up around preachers. I grew up around pastors, and I just didn't feel like I had the archetype from them to do what I was supposed to do in this particular philosophy. So I asked him, I said, as a, as a healer, as a spiritual um, leader in your tribe, I said, how do you approach your job when someone comes to you? He said, the first thing I ask them is about their medicine. And when they tell me what their medicine is, then we start the conversation. That is this philosophy. As someone who's a minister, I'm not your grandpa's pastor. I'm not the oracle. I'm not going to sit around and tell you what to do. I'm going to, I want to know where you're coming from. I want to know what the issue is. And then I'm going to say, okay, let's take the journey together. Take me into your world of discernment. Take me into your world of wisdom. Let's go look at your oracle together. That's what this is about. The teachings of metaphysics or new thought are ultimately designed to open up a personal evolutionary door for each of us in order to build the spiritual infrastructure of the religion of us. The vision quest is about getting into your own story. It's not about having something or someone else interpret your story. That's what it's about. I, cha- you know, I, I celebrate all of you for your own medicine, your own oracle. All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. All right. So, thank you.